Hi, my name is Mike Downey. I'm president of the United States Sarah Council. At the recent SARA International Convention in Chiang Mai, Thailand, which I attended, there were many outstanding speakers and presentations. For the many SARANs who could not attend, this is an edited recording by one of the best, Cardinal Togle from the Philippines. He served as parish priest, bishop, and archbishop before being appointed Cardinal of Manila. He holds numerous degrees and has, had, has held many leadership positions in the church. Cardinal Tagle underlines the necessity for every member of the church to promote vocations to the priesthood and consecrated life. And I hope you get a sense from his presentation of his humility and incredible joy as a servant of Jesus Christ. It is palpable. Here is Cardinal Tagle's presentation. Let us look at John the Baptist. John the Baptist. What is impressive is that he was very clear about his vocation. He was very clear about his calling from God. And what was his calling? He is the one who will prepare the way for the Messiah. He was very clear about that. And he spent years in the desert praying you know, and also waiting, calling people to conversion, asking them to repent but all of this as a fulfillment of his vocation to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. St. John the Baptist had no pretensions. He, he knows that his vocation is not to be the Messiah. In fact, some people approached him and told him, if you are the Messiah, tell us directly. For some people suspected that he might be the Messiah. But he was very clear. He said, no, I am not the Messiah. You know, unfortunately, in our times, many people, no, even if they know their vocation, they try to assume vocations which are not theirs, especially the vocation to be a messiah. <laughs> and so we have many, many false messiahs. And the more there are false messiahs in the world, uh, look, the world uh, uh, cannot find its, its direction. It is crucial that people know their vocation. And I want to tell you, there is only one Messiah, Jesus. So let us not ambition to receive that vocation. St. John the Baptist is clear. I am not the Messiah. So let us start this uh, Sarah International by shedding off all these false ideas and pretensions that we are somehow the Messiah. John the Baptist is the voice, but Jesus is the word of God. We are just voices and we should be happy to be voices and not to take over the word of God. That will be a disaster. Now, as John the Baptist was fulfilling his vocation, Jesus appears. John the Baptist fixes his gaze on Jesus. And seeing Jesus, he directs his own disciples, his own followers to Jesus by saying, 
Behold the Lamb of God. Clear about his vocation, John the Baptist was also interiorly free. He did not cling to his disciples. He did not say, hey, you are my disciples. You should be loyal to me. You should not go to other masters. You should be mine. No. When the Messiah came, John the Baptist, true to his vocation, let go of his own disciples and directed them to Jesus. And the two disciples did as instructed by John. They followed Jesus. This is our first lesson, or at least a lesson that I am proposing not only to you, but to myself. Just like, let us imitate John the Baptist. We are called to look to Jesus and to direct others to Jesus. This is our fundamental vocation as Christian. Not to pretend to be a Messiah, not to pretend to be the Word of God. Our fundamental calling as disciples is to look at our Master, to be attentive to Him. When He comes, even in unexpected places and moments, we should be alert. That's our vocation. To look at Jesus and to have the interior freedom to bring other people to Him. And so I ask ourselves as a way of like examination of conscience, do we spend time looking at Jesus? Or do we get bored looking at Jesus? Such that when it is time to look at Jesus, in our minds we say, when will this end? I want to look at other, other things and other people. Or do we prefer to look at our mobile phones? When it is a question of looking at our mobile phones, oh, time is limitless. We can, we can spend many, many hours. Somebody told me that during his day off, he watches seven, huh? seven movies on his cell phone. Seven. So that means 14 hours at least. But... Sometimes one minute looking at Jesus, ah, we already fall asleep. <laughs> or we say, uh, uh, is, there, is there anything more, more interesting? We spend much time looking at fake news. We spend so much time looking at commercial advertising which unfortunately sows these values, especially among our youth. I think the first invitation is to be clear about our vocation, to wait for Jesus, to look at Jesus, and finding him, seeing him, to direct others to him. Our way of looking affects our sense of vocation. If we always look at money, aha, we will feel the call of money. Look at me, look at me, and then we search for money. If we always look at fame, aha, we will feel the vocation to seek, no, honor and fame. So the question that I feel St. John the Baptist is asking us is what are you looking at? Or are you spending time looking at Jesus? 
this leads me to my second point, which is the 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 the, the flow of the story. The second point is now Jesus. Jesus looks intently at the two disciples of John. The story is all about looking. John the Baptist looking at Jesus and sending his two disciples. Now Jesus looks at the two disciples. A penetrating look. Which was followed by a penetrating question. The look of Jesus was accompanied by a question, both penetrating. What are you looking for? When Jesus looks at us, he also asks this question so that we can look into our hearts. What are you looking for? This is our second lesson. A vocation involves not only looking at Jesus, but allowing Jesus to look into me, into my heart. To allow Jesus to look into my heart. To allow Jesus to guide me into my heart so that I will see what does my heart desire. What am I looking for? In the prophet Hosea, chapter 2, the Lord says, Behold, I will lead her into the wilderness and speak to her heart. One of the fundamental questions that Jesus asks us is that, what is your deepest desire? What are you looking for? But this is also a question that we often, often avoid. We are afraid to get into our hearts, to get in touch with the restlessness of our hearts. And so we try to distract ourselves we become busy with many things and some of them are really good things but unfortunately we 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 assume so many things in order to avoid entering the deepest of ourselves where we will see what are we looking for? In the process, Jesus brings us to the truth about ourselves. And when we are afraid to look at ourselves, he consoles us. He says, look, I will join you in looking at your heart. Jesus looks at us. So let us look at ourselves with the eyes of Jesus. Not just looking at ourselves from our own perspective, but looking at us, at our hearts, with the gaze, the loving gaze of Jesus. And uh, at this point, uh, maybe uh, we, we can ask ourselves too, those of us who guide other people, in their search for their calling, their specific calling, their state of life. Uh, when we look at, at, the, at the people, especially at the young, when we look at them, we hope that they will experience through us the loving gaze of Jesus. I remember during the, the Synod of Bishops on the Youth, during the small, small group discussions, no? 
my in, in my group we asked uh, some of the young people what are your friends uh, impression of of the church you know and one of them a, a, a brave young girl said uh, your eminences your excellencies do you really want to know <laughs> we said oh yes 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 and she said oh well no the impression of some of our young people is uh, the priests are always angry. They are unapproachable. They are judgmental. When they look at us with piercing eyes, almost judging us. That's why many are afraid to go to church. Well, maybe today we can learn from Jesus how to look, how to look at those who are searching for, for something with the gentle but penetrating eyes, which leads people to their deepest heart of hearts. We go, now turn to the third point. According to the story, the two disciples had to give an answer. What are you looking for? And what a beautiful answer. I don't know whether they were prepared, but they got in touch with, their, with the deepest part of their hearts. And probably for the first time, they realized what they were looking for. They said, Lord, where are you staying? They were looking for the place, the home of Jesus. Where does he live? Where does he dwell? That reminds us of, us, of the psalm. No? Only this. I, I seek to dwell in the house of the Lord. We're searching for the Lord. We're searching for His domicile. Where can I find you? Where will I go to find you? That is the cry of the heart. And only Jesus can evoke that search. And to their heart's desire, Jesus responds, Come and see. It was Jesus' invitation to a heart that has realized what it is looking for. Come and see. It is a response to a restless heart that is searching for someone, for some place. But now it has a face. Jesus, who invites now. Oh, I know what you are looking for. Come and see. The disciples go with Jesus. They see where Jesus lives. And this is another item in the gospel. They stay with Jesus. Come, see. And then they stay with Jesus. This is our third lesson. We have many, many desires. Many desires. But we believe that underneath, beneath all our many desires, is the fundamental desire to know Jesus. And we also believe 
that Jesus will not frustrate that desire. He will fulfill that desire. If only we are honest, if people are honest about their what they are looking for. But Jesus is gentle. He will not force himself on us. He will invite us to come and to see for ourselves. Just like the two disciples of John, the response is active. It is not just a desire. The desire must move to action. And Jesus invites the people who desire to see him to act on it. Very often, uh, we, 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 we uh, maybe just re re remain on the level of the desire, but then the action, come, come, and see. And after coming and seeing, the two disciples decided to stay. This is the path of discerning a vocation in Jesus. And so gently, let us guide, especially our young people, to enter their hearts. But let us begin with ourselves. We who have heard the vocation as Sarah members to guide, to pray for vocations and to guide others to discover their vocation. Where do we prefer to go? When Jesus invites us, do we follow instinctively? No. But when others, like uh, when movie actors or celebrities invite people, come to my concert, come to my movie, oh! They all go, they fight for tickets, they fight for, for the best place. You know, so let us let us also check you know, uh, when when there every day we get a lot of invitations, but where where do we go? Where do we prefer to go and why? What does that invitation satisfy in me? Or maybe it will just frustrate me. What do I prefer to see? Come and see. With whom do we prefer to stay? Why? And maybe we, uh, vocation promoters, you know, as we will see later on, you know, should, be, uh, should give a real testimony about the beauty of coming to Jesus, seeing him, and staying with him. Which leads me to the fourth and the final point here. As we saw, the story continues in, a, in what I will call a missionary bandit. And this was not any more, uh, as it were, ordered by Jesus. But it came almost spontaneously. The disciples who came and saw and stayed, now they were running around. Andrew, one of the two disciples who went, saw, and stayed with Jesus, now seeks out his own brother, Simon. Look at that. Come, see, stay, and now go and search. He now goes and searches for, for his brother Simon. And he leads now Simon to Jesus. What John the Baptist did to Andrew, now Andrew does to his brother Simon, leading him to Jesus. And Jesus looks, <laughs> looks at Simon intently that penetrating, mysterious gaze and tells him, 
you are Cephas. A new name is given to Cephas. Again, a penetrating look. Jesus looks at the heart of Simon. Jesus invites another person, Philip, from Bethsaida, the, the place of, of uh, uh, Andrew and Simon Peter. Jesus invites Philip to come and follow him. Now, Philip, in turn, seeks out another friend, Nathanael, to inform him about Jesus. Philip uses Jesus' own words to Nathanael, come and see. And it has generated the story. The words of Jesus are now being used by those who have discovered their vocation. And their vocation has become a mission. Now they tell others, come and see. As I have already stressed, that this is our fourth and final lesson. A Christian vocation focused on Jesus is also always a mission to share with others our experience of Jesus. The way he has looked at us. The way he has asked us our, uh, our uh, 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 penetrating question. The way Jesus has invited us. What we have seen and heard and touched about Jesus. This is what St. John, the apostle, says in his first letter. What our eyes have seen. What our hands have touched. What our ears have heard about the word of life. Now we in turn proclaim to you so that our joy may be complete. Joy coming from the discovery of my vocation will not be complete if it is not shared. A vocation that proclaims Jesus through mission generates other vocations. John the Baptist, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel. Wow! Vocation generating other vocations through mission. But we can say a vocation that does not seek other people to be led to Jesus is a vocation that will dry up, will wither away. A vocation remains alive when it goes out searches for other people to be led to Jesus with the same invitation of Jesus. Come and see. If those, who, if those people who say they have a vocation do not seek out other people to lead to Jesus, we will have a vocational crisis. A vocation crisis is often rooted in the missionary crisis beginning in the homes when the parents do not exercise their mission of transmitting the faith of leading their children to Jesus we will have a vocational crisis it is always connected to mission so we ask ourselves uh, to whom do we take our families and our young people? To a concert? To a movie theater? To a shopping mall? I'm not saying that we, those things are, are not good. They are, but please, let us not forget Jesus as the most important destination so that our joy may be complete. 